Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for coming to uh, our webinar today. Uh, we're really excited to tell you more about this project that we've begun uh, at the OpenSSF called Alpha Omega. Uh, it is the beginnings of this project. It is, as we call it, an experiment. It's uh, something that uh, we put a lot of thought into, but is still very early days. And we'd love to find ways to involve all of you and, and, and push this forward and faster. So just thought we'd try to lay the groundwork uh, and look for uh, perhaps some opportunities to collaborate with all of you. Uh, let me, uh, so, so let me give you just kind of an overview of what you'll hear about today. We'll give you a bit of the background, uh, what drove some of the thinking and the conversations behind this. We'll do an overview of the, the, the mission and the kind of the vision for the project, uh, and then into some details about how we plan to actually deliver on, on that mission and vision. And we'll wrap up with uh, some, some places to go to, to where you all can contribute. Uh, and then we really want to leave a, a good chunk of time, we anticipate perhaps about half the time uh, for, of the webinar for open conversation and Q&A uh, about where we can take this. There's still so much to, to, to think about and, and, and build in this. And so involving uh, as many of you in that would be, would be great. Um, well, and just to get started, I, I'm Brian Bellendorf. I'm general manager for the Open Source Security Foundation, which is part of the Linux Foundation. I've been with the Linux Foundation since 2016 in a couple of other capacities uh, and, and leading OpenSSF since October of last year uh, and have been in the open source space for about 100 million years. Uh, why don't I pass the, the baton to Michael Scavetta to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Mike Scavetta. Uh, I lead an open source security team at Microsoft. Uh, within OpenSSF, uh, I lead the Identifying Security Threats Working Group. Uh, and I've been in software and software security for about 20 years or probably more. Um, I'm super excited to, to you know, join Brian and Michael in, in getting um, uh, this Alpha Omega project off the ground and I'm super excited to see where it goes. To Michael. <laughs> Hi everyone, Michael Windsor. Uh, I've been building software for way too long. First product was a kitchen design program back in the 80s. Um, I've also been uh, working at Google now for about uh, seven or eight years, uh, a lot of it in development tooling, and most recently for the past four or five years, really worrying about software supply chain security. I'm excited and terrified about how we're finally waking up to it and paying attention to it. Um, and I've been working with Michael and Brian on Alpha Omega now to try and put together our efforts here and, and see what we can do. So very excited to meet everybody, talk about these things, and have, we all, hope we can all learn more. Thank you to the two Michaels. So Alpha Omega is an attempt to try to really look at how open source software is being written uh, in, in the modern world. Uh, we know that open source software is the foundation of practically all modern technology. I mean, uh, we see stats out there that suggest that 90% of the average software stack uh, is actually open source software underneath, right? And we know that society needs that foundation to be safe, secure, and resilient. Uh, there's no better evidence for this than the fact that, you know, a bug in a Java logging framework can start to trigger series of meetings and public proclamations by uh, the White House and, and other uh, uh, policymaking organizations and drive actually a whole lot of <laughs> disruption and investment by uh, uh, organizations to try to close up, close up that hole. Um, but this is critical infrastructure now. And I think everybody's recognizing this even far beyond our own, our own bubble. This is bridges and highways. Um, and these are also digital public goods. And so we really need to start to think about how how do we best support the existing mechanisms for building open source code and the existing uh, maintainers and the existing foundations and organizations in a way that isn't just about delivering a, a 300 page you know tomb of thou shalt uh, uh, to them and say and penalizing them when they have a, a defect found but is instead something much more bottoms up much more supportive, um, much more systematic uh, in, in not just looking at uh, a couple of projects, but trying to really cover the breadth of, the of, 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 of all the open source projects that are used out there in a meaningful way. Um, but let's pull back and be a bit uh, uh, kind of uh, humble about the scope of that work. Uh, and that, um, you know, there's a lot of open source projects, a lot of open source developers, and we'll never close every hole. The last defect is fixed uh, when the last user has passed away, as they say. So we've got some ideas here. I, I, this is an experiment, um, but, but this experiment along a couple of very specific lines. Um, let me start first before I hand it off to, to Michael Windsor to, to kind of elaborate a bit more on what it actually is. Let me just pause and help uh, say what it's not. 
Uh, in particular, it is not a fund to pay open source project maintainers directly. There are plenty of other projects trying to do that, trying to answer the question of, you know, what's the sustainability model for open source in different ways. I, I will, there are some targeted places where we might apply some funding to help get over the hump in a couple of projects, but we'll, we'll go into that. It's not a certification body or process. We're not trying to bless or, or recognize, you know, uh, good versus bad or, or, or have a formal kind of this, you know, kind of FIPS oriented kind of thing. It's not a replacement for normal security practices. You know, our hope in fact is that this ends up being a capacity building mechanism and helps uh, lift how other organizations, other open source foundations and how companies uh, uh, build open source code and, and the practices that they adopt. So um, we're gonna be reusing a lot of stuff coming from other parts of the open SSF to make that work. Um, this is not a process for forking and taking over open source projects. You know, uh, people love conspiracy theories they, that, that doesn't get any traction here. Um, nor is this a replacement for any other existing services. You know, there's, you know, there's very little in this that we think is actually being done well by anybody else there out there in the open source ecosystem. So we'd really love to partner with anybody who has similar objectives or, or is complementary in what we do, because again, that's a big challenge. It's also not a private zero day trading club. I, I, the, we will be dealing with vulnerabilities, uh, perhaps ones that haven't yet been disclosed, but I, I, uh, the, we, there are, there's a whole universe of, of uh, proper thinking and proper care to be applied to how this get managed and how uh, maintainers and others work through uh, a coordinated vulnerability disclosure processes. Um, and finally, it's not a fully automated scanner that will just launch junk, launch junk vulnerabilities at maintainers and leave it up to them uh, to have to clean up. Uh, I, this, is, this is a bit more thoughtful than just trying to, to scattershot that out, we think at least. So why don't we transition to what it actually is? And with that, I'd like to pass the baton to Michael Windsor. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> so our mission is derived from the OpenSSF mission. The OpenSSF is here to create a space where we can, as an industry, collectively understand and solve and work out solutions in the long term for software supply chain security. More and more aware, most of you here because you've heard of it and are interested. Alpha Omega is really trying to be in a focused way, applied, directed activity. Some of that direction is specific to certain projects, and some of it is meant to be able to allow us to scale and provide scaled solutions. And so our mission is really to provide that direct maintainer engagement and bring expert analysis to actually achieve concrete outcomes, even as the tool chains and the working groups and all these other machineries that we're putting in place in OpenSSF are starting to develop the future, we're trying to act now towards just improving things and then scaling it up. Next slide. And so our aspirational vision, this is where we're trying to get to one is where, you know, critical open source projects are actually secure. And it's important to note every word here matters, critical. Not every open source project is critical. Not everything has to be secure now, just like a startup is gonna prioritize certain things over others. Same thing will be true for projects and how we consume them. And we also have to be pragmatic. We're not going to eliminate vulnerabilities. We want to find them and fix them quickly. And we've learned over and over again that the operational management of vulnerabilities post facto is as important as actually fixing the source code when you see it or making the build processes more secure. And so if you think of this as sort of constraining our vision, our mission sort of divides the big problem domain, and then our vision starts to say, this is where we're going to do this, how we're going to act our solution space. And then I think Michael Scavetta will now talk to us about each of these, Alpha and Megan, how we think about them and break it down from there. Thanks, Michael. So for Alpha, um, the main point of Alpha is working with maintainers directly. So the, uh, and I'll, I have more information on the next slide, but basically, you know, we're going to target the very most critical open source projects. So even, even among critical, if we think that there are 10,000 or 50,000 critical open source projects, the most critical 100 or 200 of that list would be targets for Alpha. Alpha will be uh, essentially expensive, time-consuming, heavyweight, um, at least heavyweight on Aaron. We hope it's not heavyweight for the maintainers. Um, a, a way for us to, to engage, understand what their security posture is, understand where their gaps are, uh, and help them to, 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 to fill those gaps and remediate those vulnerabilities and triage those bugs and, and kind of whatever is needed. If, if a project, if, if the thing that they need help with most is moving rocks from A to B, uh, and if that helps their security posture, then we should be there to help them move rocks from A to B. Uh, next slide. So getting super specific here, and, and while, while this slide has lots of words on it, um, it's, it's all intended to be um, uh, 
examples of the kinds of things that we can do and where our thinking is. Uh, as both Brian and Michael have said, th this is an experiment and this is very early days. So some of this is subject to change. But imagine, imagine you're in a restaurant and you know, and you're you're you you want to know what that restaurant can offer. So on Alpha's menu, you know, at the at the appetizer, at the beginning of an engagement with a project, we want to learn what their security challenges are. So we'll engage them, we'll have a conversation probably over the course of probably weeks um, to understand where we could have the most impact. If both we and the project both think that this is a fit, then we then we move, take a step forward and we look at, at the main courses and we look at where can where could Alpha provide the most value. This could be things like a source code audit. This could be setting up tools. This could just be, you know, helping them to, you know, in, encouraging them to set up, you know, two-factor authentication when publishing or, you know, commit signing or, or, or things like that. Um, th there were some, some projects like the, the OpenSF scorecard, which can give kind of a rundown of, you know, where a project stands on, in, on, on certain metrics. Uh, maybe improving those metrics is, is, is the way forward. Or maybe it's just that, you know, they, they get lots and lots of vulner security vulnerability reports, and some of them are low quality, and they just need help triaging them. Um, and maybe they need help um, actually creating fixes for it. Whatever's, whatever's needed there, we want to be on the table, as long as it's generally in the direction of improving the security of this critical open source project. And then at, at, you know, for dessert, we, we do want to look back and see how we did, because we do want to improve over time. Uh, especially for the first five or 10 of these um, engagements, we're going to expect to learn a lot, you know, with each one and refine things. So I hope that the 11th one will go better than the first one, but we have to start somewhere. Omega is at the opposite end of it and, and not opposite meaning like the least the least used or impactful open source project but but still within this this critical you know top let's say 10,000 is is the the nice round number that we've been using we want to use a combination of of automated tools uh, and scoring and and ml if it's you know if if that's reasonable kind of whatever tool is is, is appropriate to identify critical vulnerabilities so not all vulnerabilities but just just the ones that are most likely to be impactful uh, and then to have uh, a security analysts, so, so these, these are experts reviewing those results, validating them, and then assuming that they are um, authentic and important and, and need to be fixed, um, working with the project directly, uh, reaching out and doing the coordinated vulnerability, vulnerability disclosure, but also lending a hand in creating those fixes uh, if, if, if requested and if, and, and if appropriate. So, so while there is a, a large degree of tooling here, um, it's not exclusively tooling, it's not fully automated, there are people involved. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, um, sorry, I should have gone here earlier. Um, yeah, the, the appetizer is using the tools to collect lots of information and lots of vulnerabilities, lots of facts about, a, about, about these projects. Um, we will have, engineering, uh, it, it, software engineer, or security engineers, I guess, um, refining this rule set and building the system to automate the triage as much as possible. We want this thing to be like magically efficient such that, you know, we can kind of turn the crank on this machine and get a high quality vulnerability out of it. And we, then we just keep, keep, turning, the, keep turning the crank. Um, what, once we validate it with experts, we reach out, we get the thing fixed. And then again, we look back to see how things are going and improve the tool and process over time. Uh, again, this is an experiment. We think this will be successful in this way. If not, we will, we will adjust and, and uh, tune our, our, our approach as we learn more. And back to Brian for 
how you yeah. can. So uh, uh, there are a lot of questions, of course, that all of you may have about how all of this will actually work. Um, we are very much a part of the rest of the Open Source Security Foundation. Um, a lot of these ideas came out of conversations that were had in a number of different working groups, and we plan to stay very close to those working groups. Um, the three that matter uh, most for, for the, the activities here are the Securing Critical Projects Working Group. This is a group that's been uh, developing uh, a mix of uh, objective data, uh, you know, from things like the Harvard Census Report that talks about, uh, you know, kind of their set, their view of critical projects based on metrics that they're able to obtain, uh, to conversations that we have in those working groups about, you know, code that sits very critically in kind of the build infrastructure, but not, might not show up in a software composition analysis, that kind of thing. So um, that's a group that's chartered with creating and maintaining a list of the top 100 that was used most recently in distributing MFA tokens, for example, at the end of the year uh, to, uh, to uh, developers on the top 100 projects. Um, so we plan to work with them to, to kind of come up with these additional lists and refine that over time. Um, uh, there's an, a related question I see popping up quite a bit, which is, you know, are we, uh, how do we select from those top 100 the ones we'll be working with? And that's that's still a, a work in progress, to be honest. Um, but we'll we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, the second working group that we uh, work quite closely with is the Best Practices Working Group. Uh, this is going to be a feeder for so much of uh, what's on the menu, uh, especially in Alpha, uh, uh, to you know to to kind of talk about with projects, try to help them understand how they might adopt. I, uh, I, you know, the 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 best practices badge, uh, uh, those sorts of things, the criticality score, or the sorry, the 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 scorecards, um, you know, other practices. Uh, uh, but that's that's you know again I we do not want to walk in with the you know just read all this stuff and you, or use these tools and you'll be you'll be a okay uh, it's got to be more bottoms up and needs driven than that but the best practices group working group is creating a, a, a lot of value in, in what they're doing through that um, and then the vulnerability disclosures working group uh, this is obviously going to be a big deal as we work through the scan the results of the scans and we see things that are problematic uh, I uh, perhaps not yet clearly a vulnerability, but something that is worth talking about with the maintainers. As that evolves, if those evolve to being actual vulnerabilities, then uh, finding a way to work with those maintainers through a, uh, a graceful disclosure process, uh, such that you know those get uh, roll, those fixes get rolled out to, to major stakeholders and and everyone can be updated as quickly as, as possible once it's it's public, is going to be pretty important. Um, and so that's a working group that's done a lot to try to figure out what are the the standards and benchmarks that uh, open that might be appropriate for open source projects because most of what's out there has not been written, particularly with open source in mind. So one way for all of you to get engaged with us is to find us on those working groups. Uh, but we know as well that we will be uh, we'll need to be developing uh, kind of a public engagement model for each of these two halves of the project, right? Uh, we've got some ideas, we've got some uh, uh, things that we think might work, uh, but we want to evolve that uh, kind of more, a little bit more with, with all of you in mind. So one of the ways to stay on top of that, just a little bit out of order here, is to join a Slack channel. Um, we use Slack pretty extensively at OpenSSF. Uh, uh, we know it's not... Uh, the the best medium for having kind of deep, thoughtful conversations sometimes, but it is a good way to brainstorm, a good way to kind of um, share some things coming in from the side that we might want to think about. So uh, uh, if, if you, if, uh, if you, all of you could join the, uh, if you're interested, join the Alpha Omega, Alpha Underbar Omega uh, Slack channel at slackopensf.org. That's a great conversational way to stay involved. Um, but if that is a little bit more than you want to want right now, you just want to hear about updates and that kind of thing, obviously we'll push updates to, to Twitter and the OpenSSF account and the like, but we've also created a, a, a mailing list specifically for announcements uh, related to Alpha Omega. Uh, that link, and all these links, by the way, are being dropped in chat, uh, so you could follow that. Uh, we also have just a raw expression of interest form. If you uh, are interested in knowing more, interested in, uh, you know, have some things you might be able to contribute, uh, that's uh, the link there will take you to that place on the website as well, where you can fill that out. Um, 
this is you know this is this is really what we've figured out so far. Uh, I think now it's actually appropriate for us to uh, pivot and uh, look at the questions that have been submitted. Uh, I've sort of been scanning those a, a little a little bit, and I know. Uh, uh, and let me just kind of paraphrase uh, what I, I think is about half the questions here uh, to the two Michaels, which is what will be the criteria for you know deciding what's critical uh, and which of the projects, particularly for Alpha, I would imagine um, that we decide to work with. Uh, and I know one part of that is, you know, coming up with a, the list of 100, you know, or 200 uh, working with critical projects, but we're not going to be able to have the kind of, you know, a hands on intervention, you know, a helpful kind of kind of approach with all 100 of those projects. So uh, I'll, how, how I'll might take a stab and then about yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and Michael should chime in as well. You know, this is actually a question we've heard a lot already. Um, we're working with the working groups to get that initial list and build out from there. But our priority up front is really about our ability to get actionable, sort of shovel ready work that we can start to think about and do and learn from. And as we said several times, we're still figuring out how this is all gonna play out over time. And so one of the first sort of criteria for the early project is not necessarily what is the most critical project? What is the most biggest security thing we can fix or whatever? That's not even answerable really, but where is somewhere we can go off and start doing something now, making a difference now, learning from that effort and then feeding it back into how we do it, how we interact, how we select for projects. Michael? Uh, just to add to that, th th there have been multiple attempts you know, over the years at coming up with a list of the most critical projects. Those lists are usually different. They're all reasonable. There's no standard to, to, to judge you know, which one is better than the other, really. The Critical Projects Working Group does have a list. We like the list. That list will inform the, the, the project that we choose from. But if we made a mistake and we chose the 150th instead of the third most uh, critical project, according to the, the criteria that they used, um, we're still dealing with very important projects. So we, we don't want to be overly myopic to, to just start at number one and we don't look at number two until number one is done or anything like that. We do, we do want to optimize for, uh, as, as Michael said, uh, optimize for impact, optimize for speed, optimize for learning. Um, we, we don't want to choose very, let's just say, unimportant or unimpactful projects at the very tail end of it. Um, we're also looking at, you know, projects, um, you know, in, in, the, in the larger context of how do they in, interact with the rest of the ecosystem. Right. So an individual library may be incredibly important. Um, an ecosystem may be, like, de facto much more important than any individual project. So, so, so we're, we're trying to look at it holistically and come up with the um, just good choices that we that we all feel good about. Um, in, in, in terms of volume, uh, we'll probably have some uh, sort of a beta beta test uh, kind of pilot phase uh, for uh, for this kind of work where we'll try to evaluate, you know, how, how successful we've we been. Is there a repeatable pattern to this kind of thing? Um, and I think you know, we've been talking about trying to aim for five uh, five different projects that we could reach out uh, in, in that period of time, you know, lasting a couple of months. Um, I, I think our hope would be that over the course of the first year, we could try to reach more like 15 to, to, to 20, perhaps, of such engagements. A lot of this is going to be based uh, partly on how well we scale uh, the staff uh, that, that we're, we'd like to recruit for, for Alpha Omega. How will we think about you know engagement of volunteers in that process? This is this is hard work, and it's it's harder to ask for for folks to volunteer for this kind of thing or to to even vet that they have the right approach to this. But I think it's on us to think about how do we scale this out to to you know to be able to to um, take advantage of volunteers who show up with real skills um, and are willing to to kind of work on a on a systematic process for this. Um, so I think those are. You know, again, five fifteen is is just a dent into the one hundred. Uh, hopefully, we find ways to scale up. Uh, certainly, more resources would help with that as well. Uh, but uh, um, you know, I, I I think it'd be a while before we can claim to cover all one hundred. My hope as well is that if we can talk about the kind of work we do, um, hopefully, we can have a, a, a you know a kind of a, a a a ripple out impact on the other hundred projects as well. Um, an interesting question that that uh, came up is, you know, in our in in this work with Log for J, if we had started this a year ago, would Log for J have been on that list? Uh, and and I think there's a couple of ways to answer this, but but I'll leave it first to the two Michaels. No, probably not. I, I wish it, I wish it were. Um, as a in in the description of Log for J and and what we would have seen from a high level. Um, it, it it wouldn't have it wouldn't have been up there now. Obviously, it, it would be, but 
uh, and, and logging frameworks in general, I think, you know, people are starting to think about them a little bit differently in, in terms of kind of, let's just say magical functionality. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with Michael. I think that it's interesting to see how we learn about classes of problems, right? So uh, there's a team I work with here at Google who are focused on fixing all kinds of sort of problems in the Linux kernel. There's a class of problems they're trying to eliminate from the kernel, not just once, but in a durable way. And we could look now with the, you know, 2020 vision of hindsight and all that, say, looking, okay, points of extensibility that can have essentially, you know, outbound calls to other network services or whatever are an interesting pattern of potential risk, right? Which is not really earth shattering news. We just hadn't looked at it through the same lens as we had now, as we have now. So we might entertain a, an effort to go look at various points of extensibility. That's exactly the kind of direction I would like us to sort of start understanding and how can we reliably detect those things, right? Are there patterns of coding or analysis that we can apply to get there? These are exactly the kind of questions we would like Omega to be able to scale up and answer. And then as we are evaluating any particular project to try and figure out what we can do to make it more secure, we might look for points of extensibility as one of our touch, touch points. So. You know, the thing I'll add to this is, you know, that this is a question that kind of even a little bit more focused on the securing pr critical projects working group, because uh, they, uh, I, you know, what the, one of their, their data sources, right, is uh, the Harvard census. And there's an updated version of the Harvard census coming soon um, uh, that does rectify this. But the previous Harvard census is, uh, well, was, there was one or two, I can't remember which, but the previous one um, did not list log4j. And part of that was, um, you know, it's very dependent upon the data sets that, that they have access to. Getting access to data about which components are, are downloaded, with what frequency, um, is actually rather hard to get to. And without that, you, you can get you, you can do software composition analysis on what's embedded inside what, but you don't get a sense of impact or, or really, you know, does this matter uh, without also having usage data. So the, the Harvard project's getting better about that. Uh, I, and I, again, we're gonna try to hang our hat on, you know, that, that list of a hundred coming from securing critical projects. As we whittle that that list down, I think engaging with not just you know the individual projects that we find interesting to talk to, but also with the foundations around them is going to be important. So it's not just about talking to the log4j maintainers, right? We might do that for something critical, uh, you know, we look at that, uh, or for a, 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 you know a different JavaScript kind of component here or there, uh, but potentially talking with the organizations around them, the Apache Software Foundation, the OpenJS Foundation, and, and others to go, where might you think um, uh, you know there's some critical here to here are some projects that perhaps don't show up in the in the stats but you know from your experience uh, are, are perhaps in a bit more need of, of some of this kind of thing so um, how might and this is perhaps a provocative question um, can an open source project request to be included in either alpha or Omega like do we anticipate having kind of an application form for that kind of thing good question I don't think we've really state. talked about like, that go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, only a person named Michael can speak at the same time, right, Michael? So <laughs> go, go for it. Um, look, we would certainly entertain the conversation, right? Early on, we'd love to hear from you and your interest at some level, but um, there is no sort of like, I'm on the list and therefore someone's doing things for me kind of thing going on here. We're still figuring a lot of the stuff out in the engagement model over time. But if you are interested in being part of this, first of all, I would just say again, what we already said earlier on, become part of the working groups have a conversation there. We're really gonna to listen to the working groups around which projects are critical. And if you think yours is critical and it's not on that list, that's the consensus place to have that conversation. But we're certainly open to the conversation. Chat. Yeah. Good. Um, the next question I wanna take uh, from uh, Emily Fox. Uh, Emily, I, I think we've enabled the ability for uh, 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 folks attending to be able to participate in the conversation. Can you unmute? Is yes. it possible for you to unmute? Great. Yep. Do you wanna ask your question about security, automated security analysis? So I'm a little curious because automated security analysis is a large field and there's a lot of potential things that can go in it. So is there a kind of phased implementation approach around the kinds of automated security analysis you intend to do with these projects? Or is there one particular one that you think will be the most bang for the buck in its implementation? So right now we have a kind of a proof of concept. Um, uh, technically, it's a container with a bunch of tools installed in it. Uh, those tools in, include um, CodeQL uh, from, from, from GitHub, as well as uh, probably 15 or so other static analysis tools. They're all in that kind of um, 
uh, th that style tool. We don't, we're not constraining ourselves to only static analysis. We're trying to think of like what, uh, what a fuzzing story would be around Omega, um, particularly when it's low touch, how to automate the, the fuzzing harness stuff is a whole rabbit hole of, of challenges. Um, but we want to explore that as well. Um, so th those are the kinds of tools that we that we want to do. We're, we're, but but again, like another like similar um, a similar tool in a slightly different category. Sure, we would consider it. But what we're really looking to build though is something that has a very very low false positive rate. And as soon as I say, oh, we just threw a whole bunch of tools in a container, the alarm bell should ring, and you should say, wait, you're going to get a whole bunch of noise out of it. Um, that is that's one of the challenges that that we're that we want to face head on with, uh, particularly with the security engineering um, uh, talent that we're going to hire for this, uh, is to is to eliminate that either through kind of constantly looking at the rules and and whittling them down and scoring them, adding more context so that the rules can be more uh, applied more accurately, uh, and then just just generally, uh, I guess with the uh, with the goal of if a if the security analyst who's like reviewing the the output of these tools mark something as false positive, we should consider that a bug in our tool chain. And that, and that would you know, be on a list that we would fix. Um, we know we're never gonna get completely clean results out of, out of a tool chain, uh, but we, we wanna, the only way that we're gonna scale is by, by reducing noise. I, I'm going to drop the uh, slides so you, we can all, all talk more directly as well. Um, I think there's a couple things I'd add to that as well. One is um, I, this is, I think, a, a useful place for us to uh, think about engaging the the, the community on. Um, you know, we you know, like, like everything we do. The, the software is it will be open source. You know, uh, uh, and and figuring out how to plug in additional scanning tools is an area we're happy to engage in and, and think about you know, how do we add it to some common infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> but I, uh, as well as thinking about things like what are some of the scanning patterns for those tools uh, and how might we work together on devising a rule set uh, publicly, collaboratively with, with the public on that. Um, uh, uh, but as uh, uh, but this point about trying to uh, identify and reduce false positives, I think is also a real opportunity for us to work with open source developers on whether it's you know advanced machine learning tools to to, to look at these things or flags that people can put in code uh, to to try to highlight you know no <laughs> this really isn't a problem right uh, if there's if there's ways in which tooling can help fight the false positives pro problem because that will be the most the the major burden upon both um, the staff. If we hire and, and maintainers we work with to try to sort through, um, that's a place uh, we could really use it, uh, use, use some help. The second one is, you know, one of the things that we may end up being bound by is the operational expenses required to do scanning, right? Uh, you know, if you anybody who does CI for a modern open source project that pulls in lots of dependencies and and tries to to do you know testing and security scan security scans with each each pull request or each commit um, uh, knows what I'm talking about. These costs can quickly overwhelm uh, uh, you know uh, even a mid sized project. So one of the things we have to look at is how do we cost effectively try to really cover the gamut of ten thousand projects um, efficiently, and where might we try to get other additional resources? Cloud credits. I know some, you know, folks do offer this kind of uh, thing as a, as both a paid service and often free for open source projects. But corralling that into kind of a uniform environment is going to be, I think, perhaps a, a challenge. But again, we'd, we'd love folks help in, in trying to answer that. Anything, Michael Windsor, you wanted to add to that before oh, we jump? We're good. In? We've got a lot of questions. Let's keep going. Okay, great. Um, is Irving Wodowski Berger able to unmute himself? And would he like to ask his question? Um, then, if not, I'm happy to ask it. I'm here. Hi, Irving. Good to see you again. Hi, very nice talking to you. So as I'm hearing you talk, it would appear that the methodology processes tools you're talking about apply to any complex mission critical software project, not just open source. Am I correct? A hundred percent, Irving. Um, and you know, a lot of the practices that are being developed and discussed and evolved in the working groups came from projects that happened in other organizations or practices that are starting to emerge. And as we, in Alpha Omega, try to become even more applied and really bring what we have today and refine it and improve it, 
we want to make sure that people can benefit of that. And there's really nothing specific to open source about it. Uh, obviously, access to the source code uh, is a critical component for some of the analysis techniques mm -hmm. we use. Mm -hmm. If it's within your essentially sort of you know ecosystem of source code and as an organization, you have access to the code, it's great. There are some very interesting conversations I've been having with other OpenSSF members about vendor relationships and how do I ensure that the software I'm receiving from a vendor has had similar analysis uh, and using things like scorecard as a way, imagine a vendor producing a scorecard report of their repos and other things and, and some sort of standardized report about what kind of work I've done to, to analyze my own software. These are great concepts. We'd love to see that sort of stuff emerging out and, and playing out. Uh, and certainly the lessons we learned through Alpha Omega will be very much shared with the community and, and you know, made more available, so. And you know, the, the one reason this is particularly important is let's say uh, at MIT, which I'm affiliated with, every so often people say, well, and where do the kids learn software engineering and things like that? Turns out, especially schools like MIT and maybe the same Stanford and so on, don't teach it. It's almost like, well, that's plumbing or something like that. And part of the reason may be there is no methodology that there is agreement on to teach at, at the college level. Is that, a, do you see it that way? I think, uh, first of all, I've, I dropped out of school a very long time ago, so I can't speak to how it happened then or how it happened now. But I think that uh, I share your enthusiasm for ensuring that engineering practices start showing up in all forms of software education, whether it's a computer science degree where it theoretically is theoretical to a more intentionally computer engineering degree. And certainly these software practices need to become part of the norm. One of the phrases we use a lot internally here is we need to make writing secure software easy. Yes. And it's not today. And that's, I think, one of the sort of effective goals of Alpha Omega is to learn more about where it's hard and how to make it easier by doing it. Uh, yeah, so that's... very much in spirit of what you're trying to do. I appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, Irving, I'll also direct your attention. Um, the Best Practices Working Group uh, and, uh, has developed uh, a set of training materials for secure software development that uh, three different courses that have been put up on edX uh, mm -hmm. that uh, we've had about 6,000 people register for so far. Um, we have very ambitious goals to grow that to be something that can reach 100,000, although frankly, it's the kind of thing that <laughs> every software developer uh, should, should go through and, and read and understand and just, just how their own code could be twisted against their intent, right? Um, just how to red team their own code uh, and, and how actually that matters in open source as well. So um, I, 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 yeah, we separately from Alpha Omega, I think there's there's more investment we'll see in, in getting that out there and more widely promulgated. And, and I think some partnerships with schools that we'd love to explore too. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Tom Jones asks, and I'll just kind of be, be quick to paraphrase, will disclosure be different from CVEs? Um, maybe the, the, one of the two Michaels could talk about kind of your view on how disclosure processes will be managed uh, uh, for the things that are kind of discovered during Omega. So, so the, the CVE is kind of the tail end of the disclosure process. Um, I don't see any reason why we would invent our own, you know, and, and, and there's, to be fair, there's a lot of conversation going on about the future of CVE and how to make that better. And, and we would kind of slipstream into that. Um, I, I'd want to, uh, I'd rather um, really smart people are thinking about that stuff and we should, we should leverage that. The disclosure process though, right, you know, up until CVE um, is, is coordinated disclosure and, and, and working directly as, as, as we described. So um, that, that process, you know, we'd follow kind of just industry best practices of, you know, how to reach out and how, you know, what, one, one thing just to be super clear, there was another question later on, are we going to make vulnerabilities public 90 days after? Um, uh, we, we haven't, we've, we've talked about that. We haven't really made a decision exact on precisely what that timeline and workflow would be. Um, the, the conversation and the principles that we have in mind are, we wanna do right by the project in terms of giving them the support and the, the time that they need to fix things. But we also recognize that, you know, we are doing this on behalf of society that is by definition at that point, running a vulnerable version of the, the thing. So we have to balance that need um, and we're, we're trying to do that in a thoughtful way. We'll, we will be transparent when we know what we want to do. 
uh, and and certainly we're we're we want to continue that conversation there. Plus one to what Michael said. That's great. So plus one. Uh, Kayla under the Koffler, would you be willing to ask your question live? Yes, yes, Great. I am. Um, so my question is mostly focused, and I wrote omega in the question. Now I'm thinking, I mean, it could apply to the alpha side as well. Is there going to be a community focus when it comes to the security researchers who are identifying vulnerabilities or helping to identify vulnerabilities in some of these projects? Um, so yeah, I'm mainly wondering if there's a community emphasis or if we're going to be working with um, you know, a selected, consistent group of researchers. So I think initially, the answer is uh, more of a focus on paid staff hired for this project. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that, but most of it is just to be pragmatic, um, to be able to have someone you know fully dedicated for you know 40 hours a week doing you know doing work and being able to like move with the project. I think I think we're all in agreement that like in theory, um, having a larger community working at that, like there's a lot of security researchers out there that I would love to like direct at interesting problems, not direct, but, but have, have thinking about interesting problems. Um, th there's a whole other side of like disclosure and how do we vet and, you know, cause there, there are bad actors out there uh, as well. Um, more to come, we're, we're thinking about it actively. We, we absolutely want to use Alpha Omega generally to, as a, uh, as a lever to get more out of the system than you know we can put in directly, uh, but initially I think that the, the focus is on on direct, um, you know, d d like doing things directly uh, and having the community help. In terms of what Brian and, and Michael have said, you know, the the the, the Slack channel, the the open SSF working groups, uh, the the core tools that we use, and kind of advancing our thinking in, in how to do this do this well. Okay. Um, let me move on to, to DJ Ware. Um, DJ, would you be willing to ask your question about Linux distributions uh, on the call? Or I can read your question. I'm kind of calling people out of the blue. I might be surprising them. I apologize. <laughs> Uh, well, DJ asked, um, what is our, our vision for how this interacts with, say, Linux distributions and their associated repositories? You know, we might also cover some of the other sources of repositories out there, you know, Maven, PyPy, those, those sorts of things. I, I, I don't think that we're, we're limiting ourselves to any particular distribution or package ecosystem or anything else. Um, you know, I... I we sh we should be thoughtful in going in looking at places where we think we can have the most impact. So for certain Linux distributions, um, you know, I, I I don't I don't think well for me Sorry, I haven't thought deeply enough about it to have like a good really good canned answer here. But everything's on the table. We'll try to do. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll try we to focus. I wasn't trying to get too much in the weeds. I was just trying to understand if I was looking, there's so much overlap in different packages on different features that they have. How would I identify that as a developer to say this, I know this has been vetted and this one hasn't is really, really more of the question. Okay. I think DJ, that's a, it's a really good question. And it leaks into some of the other questions around S bombs and are we doing applications or packages or whatever? Um, I think the granularity of effort in Alpha Omega will be at what you would think of as a package level, whether it's an operating system package or a language package or some sort of open source project of some kind. But when you start aggregating and assembling things into an application, then your SBOM of like, at the end of the day, the, the person who cares about the SBOM is the application operator who says, what do I have running live in production? What vulnerabilities have I pushed out there or do I not wanna push out there? And what has emerged since I pushed it out? And those are two different conversations. Our effort is not, in Alpha Omega focused on sort of that aggregated space of like what happens and all this stuff comes together, how do I deal with that? It's a great problem and there's a lot of work going into it in various working groups and organizations. But we're looking at the, essentially the raw ingredients of that cake, if you will, and trying to like on a piece by piece basis. Now, obviously there's a dependency graph. Some Debian package is built up using some, uh, you know, Python library or, or something like that. And so there's obviously a transitive set of problems that kind of work through there. But the decision about 
how a particular vulnerability affects the package is a package level interpretation. So, you know, you may use Alpine, it may have tar, Tim may have a vulnerability, but the way you use Alpine and tar does not, or does not create that vulnerability. Those are so that each, again, the, the granularity of the package becomes the point at which we can start to make a security decision and evaluation of is there risk or not. And I think that's how we're, we're trying to focus it right now. So this is not a, I checked with Alpha Omega and they said, I'm okay. That's not, that's not, this is, you know, where we're going. This is, um, you know, can we address the, the, the industry-wide debt around security posture across a whole bunch of packages? And that, that leads to, I think, Andrea's question as well. And so I'm actually, can we call Andrea to ask Sure, her uh, Andrea Brambilla, uh, if you had a good question about critical projects, do you want to ask that? If you're able to unmute, apologies again, springing this on you. <laughs> and, and, and Andrea asked, um, I may be naive, but the most critical projects are probably also the ones with the best security posture. Is the current security posture uh, uh, posture party of picking the projects for alpha? Oh, part of picking the projects for alpha. And so uh, you're not naive. Um, but I think that industry-wide, everybody is starting to realize that we have a certain amount of security posture debt across how we do things, whether it's how we build them, whether it's whether we've gone off and looked for, you know, vulnerabilities, you know, on a regular basis and looking at these new patterns that are emergent, like I mentioned about extensibility before. Um, and then, you know, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to lean into that? Uh, so our feeling is, although there are a lot of projects that have tremendous amount of eyesight on them and a lot of eyes helping make it better and a lot of investment in security there's like every one of those has work to be done and there are opportunities where we can make a difference either by scaled approaches or by focused efforts and again we'll find out right but we certainly had conversations with various projects who would unabashedly tell us that you know the way they build their software is not how we might have offered to do so uh, and those are interesting conversations to have and non-trivial journeys to change right to get from where you are to the right place so not everything is a sort of traditional vulnerability sitting inside a piece of code that hasn't been looked at. Some of them are, as you said, posture in terms of code reviews, two-factor auth, et cetera. Those are some of the more actionable things, but there's also a fair amount of stuff where has anybody looked and say, how can I go off and do this now that I've learned about this new pattern? And that's where I think we can lean in as well. It's a great question, appreciate it. Let me um, turn next to John Mark Walker. Um, John, are you, John Mark or Jam, are you uh, able to unmute? I, want to ask I am here. Yes, Great. thank you. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I've noticed that like even when fixes are available, a lot of times vendors, technology software vendors have very poor practices when it comes to updating their dependencies and getting the upgrades into their products in a timely fashion. I was just wondering if, if part of this will address like education of vendors and trying to, you know, pull them down the, the righteous path. So, so vendors specifically, I would say probably not. Um, yeah. I mean, although I, I would hope that the um, Alpha Omega itself kind of spurs future conversations that do have an impact there. Um, I, I would, but if you if you change out vendor for another open source project, then I would say yeah. that part of our analysis, you know, if we see, especially as part of Alpha, that a, you know, a, a, a larger project, you know, has a, a package lock file that hasn't been updated in four years. Um, that's interesting, and, and that would be part of our, you know, is there a, is there a reason why that's so out of date and and testing challenges? And there's all sorts of reasons why, like package lock files are good, but they're also they're also bad. Um, yeah. We want to be able to. Uh, I, I think I think the world needs another year or two of kind of thought going into how to like what what the right trade off there is. This is this is a really interesting problem, John Mark. Um, and you know, everybody has it in some way or another, you don't want to live at head, but you want to live kind of close to head. And what right. I'm starting to point. see, right. And yeah. I'm starting to see there's a couple of things and I to talk about one is the cost of in adding a, a open source project to your organization's dependency graph, you might have a security view, some sort of business policy or whatever, or in some cases, no policy whatsoever. The cost is can be quite deceptively low. And the total cost of ownership matters here. And then the cost of keeping up to date with it 
is a hidden cost that people often don't pay. And, and the metaphor I like to use here, and it's my favorite one, and somebody in my team gave it to me, is people tend to treat open source as free, as in free beer, but it's really free as in free puppies. And you're taking on a responsibility within your organization for maintaining that thing. And it's not, you know, there's a bunch of other people making some great code for us here. We'll just use them. They're awesome. We're getting free work here. But then you don't pick up those updates and now you're not living at head. And now you are essentially an unofficial, poorly declared, half-baked, green spun's 10th rule like fork of that original project. And you just haven't admitted it yet. Wow. Right. And so that's a big problem. I want to be clear. I don't think that that is within our remit within Alpha Omega to solve. It's part of the openness to Ceph's remit. And a lot of people are thinking about things to get there. And one of the things I think is important there is what is stopping people from continuously updating? And I think it's about information. Do you have enough information to make an informed decision about this update? Do you have enough trust in the community such that you can pick up changes more reliably, more frequently and live closer to head versus, oh man, I got to do another three month review of this three line PR, right? Like, you know, and that boundary is really interesting. That's where, you know, love to have continued conversations there, but I don't think that's part of the Alpha Omega scope. I want to follow up on one other thing from the previous question and answer too, which is it's it's not our intent uh, to be seen as an arbiter of whose security postures are strong or weak or to be publishing stats on that or that kind of thing. There are other efforts to do that. Um, I, it, you all are familiar with the best practices badge with the scorecards. You probably know that you can go to uh, metrics.opensf.org and see for I think a million different repositories uh, how well they do against the scorecards and, and best practices badges. Some of the CNCF landscape uh, pictures now offer best practices badge as like a variable to select from uh, some of the other landscape deployments out there. And we do see actually uh, in a different part of OpenSSF expanding uh, kind of that, that type of uh, uh, understanding risk and security posture across open source projects in other ways too. Um, uh, that look more for that, and inevitably that'll be a factor in some of what Alpha and Mega uh, work on. But but that's that's definitely going to be a separate kind of initiative. Um, there's a lot of good questions that Emily Fox asked. Uh, can I bring her back onto the mic to to ask one of her choice? Sure. Um, as part of your engagements with these projects, are you also looking into the IDE extensions, um, such as those that maintainers are using, not everybody does, um, to assist them uh, in ensuring that they're writing better, more secure, secure code prior to its commit or merge into these projects? I know this is a newer conversation I've been having with other security professionals across industry that we often forget that IDEs are used, and that's really where the code actually starts to happen. I love that question. and. Uh, I'll be, I'm going to be careful. Yes, we absolutely need to do it, but we is the royal we of OpenSSF. The Security Tooling Working Group, I think, is the perfect place to have those conversations and advance those things. We would love to feed our learnings into that working group, uh, as well as you know the, the, the broader community, um, because absolutely we need better um, IDE-based squiggly underlines or, you know, Whatever, whatever is needed to, you know, um, write more secure code. So very strong supporter of that. Same here. Uh, I know we're getting close to time, so I'm going to uh, try to be uh, super quick here. Um, uh, there's an interesting question by, from uh, Johan Holmberg. Uh, Thanks for the initiative. It is a daunting task and lots of real work ahead. At the same time, the security experts are not really idling at the moment. Uh, how do we attract volunteers to this project? Uh, and I'll add on to that. You know, we're going to have to hire some people for this as well. So uh, uh, any, any thoughts the two Michaels might want to share on, on that? Frankly, I think that was one of the reasons why we went to, are, are going down the route the, the route of we need to hire people um, because it is a very it is very difficult finding available um, security talent especially ones that you can count on for many hours we also don't want to treat security researchers as a free resource you know I think fundamentally you know you should get paid for your work um, and that gets much more complicated in a like quasi volunteer, sign up scenario um yes we fully recognize that the market is is difficult uh at the moment or awesome at the moment depending on which side you're on 
So uh, we will try to tackle the remaining list offline and get back to the folks who've asked that question. Uh, uh, so uh, they're, they're, we're, we're, the backlog is 30 questions, so try to give us a bit of time to, to get to them. Uh, try anything about the ones that are, are probably worth trying to answer here in the short term. Michael, you want to pick one? Yeah, I think I think there was one a couple of questions I saw about you know are we going to work with kind of uh, commercial vendors and like what's our relationship with there would we license commercial tools? Yep. Um, I, I think everything is on the table. Uh, I would prefer not to, frankly, blow a large portion of our budget on licensing a commercial tool. Um, I would much prefer partnerships there. Um, par partnerships meaning free, um, but. Uh, I think the most important bit there, especially for Omega, is the quality of the tool and the the you know. So having a ha having a free tool that generates lots of false positives is a net. It could be a net negative for for us. So we want to be careful in what we integrate, how we integrate, and how we're able to tune that tool over time. Uh, but I don't think I, I why so while a large portion of the tool chain that we use and and everything is intended to be open source like code ql the engine is not open source to be to be clear we are using code ql i'm open to using others um you know in, in the same kind of capacity or even better absorbing like data sets of high quality you know result like at the, at the end of the day what i really want to do is find more vulnerabilities and fix more vulnerabilities so whatever whatever helps us do that i think we're we're open to at least a conversation about and then I, I'm just going to grab one of Emily's questions because I think it's it's very poignant. Like, so you mentioned a few weeks previously for the appetizer portion of the alpha project. Is it expected that engagement will take one to two months? And do you have an intended cap for the engagement time frame? That's a great question, Emily, and on a long list of great questions already. Um, the answer is we don't know yet, right? We're still like, and we're very excited by all the interest, and we have yet to hire our first employee. Um, but I think that these are you know, things that we will probably start out with an initial impression of like, let's spend two months on project X. And then after two months, we'll say, was that enough? Did we learn enough or whatever? And we'll figure out what the right engagement is. Um, if you have experience and thoughts that tell us, you know, the average engagement on this takes N months, that would be awesome to know. It will help us sort of plan our thoughts there as well. Um, I, I don't pretend to know the answer to that question. Uh, but it, it, it's exactly like, to me, the reason I chose this question is it sort of embodies the spirit of all the things that we don't know about how to do an alpha omega like effort. Uh, and I think it's sort of a great way to close the questions. And we will, as, as Brian promised, answer as many or all of them as possible offline. But like, we're here learning and we really, these questions were as much a valuable part for us having this conversation as it was for you to hopefully hear what we had to say, because we will then incorporate this back into how we think about it and continue to build on it. Yeah. Um, well, I, <clears throat> we are getting close to time. It's tempting to ask one more question, which is uh, from Ben Rockwood, to what degree will Alpha Omega forward other security standards, such as Salsa, Provenance, uh, or software bill of materials? Um, which of you would want to take that? I'll, I'll take a stab. Look, we're obviously very interested in what the working groups are doing in the OpenSSF. Those standards are about practices. They're about tooling. As I said at the beginning, in terms of our mission and vision, right? they are essentially starting to shape the future that we hope will influence the whole industry and help the whole industry make being a soft secure, writing secure software easier. That's not what we're doing in Alpha Omega, right? We will look at the signals that they represent. So for example, if a project has a very high security posture and a community that has invested continuously in that, that's a signal that's interesting to us, but at the end of the day, it doesn't change whether or not we can go and find bugs in there or whatever. Somebody else asked a question about the kernel, right? There's obviously a tremendous amount of eyes on the kernel from a security point of view. Do we need to make that one of our projects? Those are exactly the questions, right? We probably don't. Or we're not going to prioritize them because they haven't, you know, there's a lot of eyes already looking on it. And so, yeah, I think I've answered it. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, <clears throat> we should probably wrap up here. Um, uh, Michael Scavetta, uh, any last words? Uh, no, I... I... I really appreciate everybody's time and, and, and taking the hour to to listen and engage with us. Uh, I'm hoping this is the uh, well. I'm confident this this is the start of a uh, you know longer discussion and a you know continued engagement. So please keep the questions coming and and hold us accountable to to delivering on the vision that we that we've articulated. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Windsor, anything? 
Uh, I, I think I ended nicely. Okay, great. Uh, and I, I just again want to thank everyone for showing up as well. I, I, we dropped the links in the chat. The link to the presentation deck as well as the recording will be on the webinar page and everywhere else we can put it. If you want to continue the conversation, join us over uh, at Slack on the Alpha Omega channel, uh, the OpenSSF Slack. And with that, thank you all for uh, attending and such great questions. Thanks. <laughs>